Could you tell us about the call? About the call. I held up the press conference. Uh, they did call at uh, 4.58 a.m. Uh, my husband's closer to the phone. We were still in bed uh, trying to sleep. Um, and they asked for Professor Strickland, and he handed it to me going there asking for Professor Strickland, because I had already been screaming, what's wrong? Um, and uh, so then they said to me, uh, this is an important call from Sweden. You must stay on the line. Please stay on the line while we transfer the call. And then I stayed on the line for over 15 minutes because I am a rule follower. Um, <laughs> and then I said, there's got to be something wrong. So we did hang up. But, but my husband and I discussed this a long time, like how long am I supposed to hang on? And then I kept saying, this would really be a cruel prank if this is just somebody pranking me. And so then I had to get on my email, and it, and it said, We're, we can't uh, phone you. Please call us immediately. So then I had to call them. Uh, but at least that email did say they were from the Swedish Academy. Uh, and then I called them, and they, and they told me how we, I would share the prize, and that they asked if I would um, take part in the press conference. And again, I didn't realize that was an optional thing. I was the only one of the three of us that did uh, do that. But um, anyway, there we are. That was it. <laughs> And, uh, sorry, just a follow-up, no indication this was coming uh, for work that you did back in 1985? No, the Nobel Prize is a secret thing. There isn't any discussion or anything like that, and nobody asked. It's, it, most awards, you get asked to supply your resume, and your, but that, not for the Nobel, no. Nick Dixon, CTP. So with that in mind, how does that feel then knowing that this is that much more special? It's not that you had to submit, you didn't apply. This is just a reflection of research you've done. I, I, all I can say is that I'm overwhelmed, really. Uh, I will tell you that over the years, because this is for work done a, a long, long time ago, um, somebody did comment, actually somebody from the Nobel Prize, think, they think it's the first time ever that someone got it for their very first paper. Um, so over the years when I've met people, they have said, you know, haven't you got that Nobel Prize yet? But I always thought they were kidding with me, right? So I didn't ever think that that's, the CPA would um, merit that. Um, yeah, so obviously it's, it's a real thrill, and I'm looking forward to talking to Gerard about it. I have, people ask me that a lot, too. Out of the 600 emails I've received so far today, Gerard and I have not uh, talked to each other yet about it. Dr. Strickland, last year in a news uh, in a lecture that you did, it was broadcast lecture. Oh my goodness! You said at one point that women come a certain amount of weight in science because you, you said you weren't doing Nobel Prize research, but you were at least getting paid to be a scientist. Do you, I don't know if you remember making that comment. I've made it today. I didn't know I made it earlier. So it's bad to keep repeating yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's true. It's true. I mean, this is, this is one of the, and, and I think some of the undergrads from my class are here. Um, when I get on my soapbox, if I teach E&M, I talk about Maria Gabriel Meyer. I did cite her in my own thesis. She is the last woman to win a PhD, or win a PhD, win a Nobel Prize in physics. Um, you know, and, and first of all, I will also admit, should I admit this? I actually uh, called her he in my thesis, except that uh, one of the people reading the thesis said, shame on you, Donna, and changed it to she. Because um, I knew of the work and did not know that she was a she. Uh, and it was after that that I read about her and how, you know, she never got a paid job. Right? There she is, dude. And actually what I cited her for was she was a, a theorist can do things that experimentalists can't because they don't have to wait for the laser to be invented. So in 1939, she predicted that uh, an atom could absorb two photons. Nobody had thought of that before. And it was a woman that thought of it and changed how we do uh, that area of science. That's not what she won the Nobel Prize for, though, a nuclear shell. And yet, she just followed her husband from job to job while he became a professor and went up the ranks and moved universities to do that as a chemist. And she would be allowed to teach if she wanted to, and she was allowed to have an office if she wanted to sit there and do some research on her own, but didn't get paid until the 50s. And yet, the work I cited her was from 1939. And so, obviously, women have come a long way. I feel I get paid the same, and I felt like all along I've always been paid the same and treated the same. In layman's terms, what your research has done for the world and what it means, really? <laughs> Uh, I, that's a harder question because uh, people keep asking first about the LASIK surgery, which is still the number one uh, use of the thing. It's not for, the, for those of you who have had LASIK <coughs> surgery. It is a UV laser that 
the V cuts uh, your cornea. It is cutting the cornea flap that this laser has worked on. And that was back in the 90s, so it was just 10 years after we first did CPA. I certainly heard about it just as that was happening and thought it was amazing at the time that uh, I could have done a laser that was definitely being thought of um, for doing atomic and molecular physics. Right? When we were doing it, we just knew that what we were trying to do was get the electric field beyond the electric field that holds the electron to the atom. So that's what we were trying to do, and so that for somebody else could turn it around and, and just get a good use out of it, that's great. Was it ever a lifelong goal to win the Nobel Prize? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Why? No. No. Very. I mean, obviously, very few people win the Nobel Prize. So why would you want to waste too much time thinking about that? Um, <laughs> no. I th you know, obviously, I'm thrilled to win it. I'm not saying that it isn't an absolute thrill to win it, but but it certainly, it never entered my mind that I would. A question for the president, actually. A lot of people are uh, commenting today that uh, currently uh, Professor Trickler is an associate professor. Uh, <laughs> the is, does this help her become now a full professor? Mm. <laughs> Without the paperwork. I guess the Senate has unanimously approved now. Um, it's a process, there's a governance process that has to be followed by everybody, including Professor Strickland. Uh, but I... Back in that, uh, you've got students on one side, faculty on the other side. I was wondering how it was divided, okay. You know, standing ovation here. What is that like? You said there's not many people win Nobel Prizes. So what is that like when you walk into a room of your peers and people you're teaching, and they're giving you a standing ovation, and you know you're a Nobel laureate? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, I don't know that it's, yeah, I guess I do know that. Um, I think it's more humbling. I don't know. I find it very hard to walk into a room full of people applauding me. I'd, I'd find that hard to do. Questions from students? Sorry, one more, then, if, if I can. Lisa has her PhD. Multiple things that awarded Nobel Prizes, like Nobel Prize in Physics, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, what would this award do for your research as for the school going forward? Hopefully good things. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, hopefully it helps to, to be a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, I don't doubt that I'll have uh, more students wanting to work with me. Uh, the student who's doing his uh, fourth year project with me right now had to email me going, I was going to ask anyway, so sorry that it's the day, you know, that you win the Nobel Prize, but it's not because of that. Um, and, <laughs> and, and I believe him. Um, is he here? I don't know. Uh, so, so hopefully, hopefully only good things. Hopefully it's not a hindrance. I can't see how it could be. Uh, I think we probably ought to uh, recognize that there are many more inquisitive and inquiring minds in the room than our French and the world. Um, yeah. Nick, may I just jump in yeah. with your last question? I think from, again, uh, this for uh, Professor Strickland, this is now something very new and I think uh, uh, we're going to have uh, a long talk as to how we're going to plan those things. But as far as the university goes, I, I think there are a number of very important points here, one of which is the university is very proud, as we showed it at the United Nations in New York City last week, how committed we are to, to, to invite more women and girls to, 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 to come and study in STEM disciplines. This is a fantastically strong message. This is the first, she is the first woman in Canada. The first Can if you put enough adjectives, first you can always Canadian, be the first. I am the first in, Canadian in, in 55 woman. 55 years, so this is, this is, this Ever. is not, first this Canadian. is, this first is Canadian fabulous. Woman fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> We've been working very hard to increase the number of women faculty in STEM disciplines, especially in science and also students, graduate, undergraduate, so this will be a very, very strong message to everybody that if you work hard, you can win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also work hard and not win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so as I was saying, with that in mind, there are already um, both Nobel Prize winners in the room who uh, now uh, have been asked a question of uh, Wolsey's first ever First Canadian Nobel. Um, First Canadian woman. You have to have enough adjectives. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, 
So please, uh, the, the floor is open to you, and please don't ask if you can have a pass, um, because you might get an answer, yes. Hi, uh, Nathaniel Smith, uh, Department of Chemistry here, but uh, always a fan of physics. Um, <laughs> and a fan of uh, unrestricted uh, scientific discovery. As a young scientist, uh, people like me try to find our path on uh, how theoretical we should be, should we just follow our curiosity, but how applied should we be? Um, can you just comment on a young you, um, as a young scientist, how you navigated that, and if you were pulled more towards just general curiosity, or if you felt pulled towards applied science and science that could be applied to humanity? More on specifically, what do you think a scientist's role is uh, to humanity? Is it just to discover for the sake of discovery, or do we have a a responsibility of scientists mm. to help the world? Simple question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I have two answers to that question then. Uh, the first one is how I navigated it. And, and I've been told by a reporter that I use the word fun a lot, but I actually think that we all should do what we find fun and what we can do. When my daughter was quite young, um, she was being asked by her friends about me going out to work in another state rather than staying home. And my answer is the world works best if we all do what we're good at. You know, I had a nanny trained for three years in nanny school in Britain, and she was much better at looking after my children than I was. Um, and I said that that was the case, and uh, she was considered the third parent in the family. And I said, I'm much better at tweaking lasers, and so I should be out there in the world tweaking lasers, and that we should all do what we're really good at. So did I ever think, oh, I should be doing something to help humanity? No, I just think if we all do what we're really good at, it just helps the world. That's all. Thank you. Does anyone else in the room want to ask a question of the Nobel Prize? Does we have one in the back Is this working? Yeah. We can all hear you anyway, Rob. This isn't a question, but <laughs> you can see your whole department is here. I Congratulations. I appreciate that. We are so class, that's what he's letting me know. <laughs> yes, we have. Oh, uh, yes, we have to see you. Go ahead. Uh, no. Uh, so, but I do know that my supervisor, Gerard, knew it would be very big. Okay, but this is how unready we were. Uh, my, the very first laser, the paper that's, you know, got me the Nobel Prize, uh, made a gigawatt of power, right? So it was a millijoule and a picosecond. And he said, Donna, when you go give your very, very first talk ever at a conference, he goes, Donna, when you go, you must say it's the way to make, oh, what is 10 to the 15? I don't know. We must have a, li you know, we have a library here. What's the word for 10 to the 15? You must know. And I said, I don't know. And so we ran around the library the night before I went to the conference to look up the word Padawat. Okay? So uh, that's six orders of magnitude beyond what I did. And I, as a young grad student, I was thinking, you want me to go in front of all the laser people and say, no, oh, you know, we've done this, but this is really the way to go for six more orders of magnitude. I have to say, they have built five petawatt lasers, like they're up to five petawatts now. Uh, it, it took 10 years to get to the first petawatt. He was right. We certainly knew it was the way to go. It was a money issue that we couldn't go there because it takes a great big giant laser, as you can imagine. Um, so we knew it would be big. But d does that mean that we thought Nobel Prize now? Well, I don't know if you asked Gerard, it might be a different story. Maybe he knew, but I didn't know. We will throw it. Oh, all right. Just one, uh, Ron Charles again from CBC. Uh, once again, could you explain once again the reason you and Dr. Rowe, uh, Professor Rowe, came up with this uh, method for uh, expanding the capacity of lasers? All right, so uh, Gerard was already a leading person in the world of ultra-fast lasers, and he had a lot of short-pulse laser systems. 
when I was a fairly new uh, graduate student, he had read a theoretical paper on how to get to uh, what was called higher harmonics that would need an intense laser. And so he just uh, gave me the paper that day and said, let's uh, think about how we can make an intense laser to make this work. So I took a long time to get that result. Um, we tried different ways first that did not work. Uh, and then over the course of uh, four years, uh, other people were out there trying to do uh, pulse compression and it just sort of all fit together as to how come doing the CPA technique would be, you know, like I scrapped what I did and, and switched to CPA because it would be the way to make intense lasers. So in reality, was it, it was the solution to a problem uh, that existed in terms of lasers not being able to whoa. Only, I, only I'm in the spotlight, sorry. Um, in terms of lasers not being able to become powerful enough. Uh, uh, back, like, so I did this work from uh, 84 to 85, and at the time you could either have short pulse lasers or you could have high energy lasers. You could not have both because you would blow up the laser if you put the peak power in the laser. So, uh, yes. Now, of course, after we published it and after people came to the lab, they said, well, you know, the radar people did this back in World War II. Okay, so, you know. You, we always keep reinventing the wheel. Um, we have a question from our friends on the phone. Uh, Ivan Garon from uh, AFP asks, um, not my question, I must hesitate to add, um, how do you assess the situation of funding in your field? And do you think there is enough funding for basic physics research? There's never enough funding for basic research. So, <laughs> um, so that would be the first answer. Uh, in my own field, certainly when I came back to Canada 20 years ago, uh, Nortel and JDS were flying big. And so when I came back, I really, you know, had a pretty easy time compared to my colleagues. Uh, money was flowing my way because I did optics. And then unfortunately, Nortel and JDS are not the giants. Well, Nortel doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, and so things changed for those of us that studied optics. So obviously, I would love those days to come back. I'm waiting for another Nortel any day now um, to help us out. But uh, yes, I, I think all governments should support scientists. I think the, uh, the president of the University of Waterloo has said for many occasions how badly he hopes that we are the institution that gives birth to the next billion dollar Canadian company. Um, I think with that, unless there are questions from, from our students in the room. Yes, you do? Okay, one more, go ahead. Um, do you have any advice? Press the button, please. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice to young female scientists? Um, Maybe for all the difficulties that they face, any advice that you want to share? Yeah, I do, I do get asked that a lot. Um, I will tell you that uh, in my own, I think I went through with just blinders on. Uh, I don't think I purposely put the blinders on. I just think I, I just look that way. I, if I want something, I just see what I want. And if people say no, I think they're wrong. Um, so I think that's good advice. If somebody else says that, you know, something that you don't believe in, just think they're wrong and you're right and keep going. Because that's pretty much the way I always think.